The people who lost power in Moore County, the 45,000 people who lost power, aren't all queer drag queens. A one-year-old child suffered as a result. Elderly people suffered as a result. You would imagine many of which are conservative. Elderly people in North Carolina being conservative? Shocking. This is not simply targeted to do damage to people that they don't like. It's also hitting other people in collateral, uh, which I guess they're okay with. They're okay to throw away some of their own to get the infinitesimally small percentage of people they don't like, who are apparently simultaneously super weak, but also all powerful. So if you've been watching my content for any length of time, you should understand by now that the right wing and extremist right wingers are the greatest domestic threat to the United States' national security. And you don't just have to be watching my content to know that you also just really only need eyes, ears, and the ability to look at data and statistics and come to conclusions that any reasonable person would come to. Like the fact that right wing extremists have been responsible for 95% of domestic extremist related killings over the last decade, 10 years in the United States of America. They say 75%, but we will add the domestic Islamist extremism into that too, because they are also right wing. That is nothing new. We saw this with the Colorado Spring shooter who is to stand trial at time of recording, I believe at some point in the near future, uh, who has apparently been charged with hate crime charges. That's a new update we got some time ago. Also, it turns out that He's no longer using they, them pronouns, and we don't know if he still identifies as non-binary anymore, but certainly we know he doesn't use they, them pronouns anymore, because apparently his lawyer is using he, him pronouns since the shooter was charged with a hate crime anyway. So, oh my god, who could have expected this? If you haven't seen it already, I've got two videos on Colorado Springs, one of them being titled, The Right is Defending the Colorado Springs Shooter, and you can watch that one, we'll link to it. Literally, the only reason he was doing this was to try to dodge hate crime charges. Oh my god, how could a non-binary person shoot up a queer bar if they're non-binary? That's so crazy. Nobody has ever heard of a member of a mar marginalized group being bigoted to members of that marginalized group. Now it turns out he wasn't actually a part of that marginalized group because he's getting charged with hate crimes anyway. The, uh, the DGEN's gambit, I guess, didn't really work out in his favor for that one. Uh, but we've got more alleged, potentially maybe, right-wing domestic extremism and terrorism potentially, in the United States of America. You've probably heard about it already. This is the first time I'm covering it on my channel. Moore County in North Carolina was hit with blackouts, lost power in the middle of winter for around 40,000 people. That's not very good in the middle of winter. Uh, apparently, Moore County, North Carolina has a very large population of elderly people. Like, I believe it's substantially large or an outsized proportion of Moore County uh, residents are elderly, are older. So, you're in winter, and now you lost heat and you're old. That's not really a recipe for survival, I have to say. But we'll get more into that. And like I say, we don't know if there's any connection yet to any right-wing group. All we know is that right-wing groups were celebrating it after it happened, right? So here is a updated article from CNN from December 7th, 2022. Investigators are zeroing in on two possible motives centered around extremist behavior in North Carolina power stations attacks, sources say. Investigators who found nearly two dozen shell casings from a high-powered rifle are zeroing in on two threads of possible motives centered around extremist behavior for the weekend assault on two North Carolina electric substations, according to law enforcement sources briefed on the investigation. The news comes as the primary utility company in Moore County restored electricity to the final customers of the 45,000 homes and businesses that initially lost power. Officials on Wednesday also announced a total of $75,000 in reward money for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or people responsible for Saturday's attacks. One thread involves the writings by extremists on online forums encouraging attacks on critical infrastructure. This isn't very new at all, by the way. The second thread looks at a series of recent disruptions at LGBTQ events across the nation by domestic extremists. This also isn't very new, by the way. The FBI and North Carolina State Bureau are assisting in the investigation. So apparently, if it was just up to North Carolina, it might be a lot more difficult for them to get to the root of what happened here, find suspects, charge people, etc., etc. But the FBI is involved because if you attack power infrastructure, you're attacking the state. And 
and you're also attacking the federal government because the federal government handles rather the entire power grid of this country obviously it's partitioned if you're in texas as we saw when texas absolutely shat the bed uh when they lost power in the winter some time ago because they for some reason are not connected to the other power sectors east or west they have their own because they are mentally deranged uh the people in power in texas are but anyway now that the FBI is involved, that certainly gives North Carolina authorities a lot more resources to find out who was behind this. Now, it's not to say that that's a guarantee that we're going to find out who it was. It's not to say that we're going to find out that it was connected to any kind of right-wing extremism. We don't know yet. Like I say, it's all alleged. Now, we have good guesses to be made up until then, but for now, that's all they are. But we've got some leads. Investigators have no evidence connecting the North Carolina attacks to a drag event at the theater in the same county, but the timing of two events are being considered in context with the growing tensions and armed confrontations around similar LGBTQ events across the country, the sources told CNN. So this was uh, one of the big speculations that a lot of people had on the left broadly. Could this be possibly related to an LGBTQ event, a drag event that was happening at a theater in Moore County at the time? Did they maybe want to disrupt infrastructure to be able to disrupt that event indirectly without having to show up there because they have had mixed results with that, depending on if left wing people show up armed to defend them, which has happened like the John Brown Elm Fork Gun Club, etc, etc. In the past two years, anti-government groups began using online forms to urge followers to attack critical infrastructure, including the power grid. They have posted documents and even instructions outlining vulnerabilities and suggesting the use of high powered rifles. One 14 page guide obtained by CNN cited as an example the 2013 sniper attack on a high voltage substation at the edge of Silicon Valley that destroyed 17 transformers and cost Pacific Gas and Electric 15 million in repairs. In that case, the shooter fired more than 100 bullets in about 20 minutes, disappearing a minute before police arrived. The case remains unsolved. While investigators haven't found a rifle in the North Carolina shootings, the casings still could offer critical evidence. A law enforcement source told CNN that the caliber of the bullets in the California incident is different from those used in North Carolina. Investigators are taking into consideration the timing of Moore County shootings. 7 p.m. on a Saturday night coincided with the time a drag performance sponsored by the local LGBTQ community began. According to these sources, audience members used their phone flashlights to light the stage for one last song, but after that, the performance couldn't continue due to the power outage, according to Sand Hills Pride. Officials said that the gunfire, which left much of the county without electricity for days, were a, quote, malicious and, quote, intentional attack. The two substations are about 10 miles apart. No suspects in the outages have been announced. Sheriff Ronnie Fields said whoever fired at the substations, quote, knew exactly what they were doing. No group, quote, has stepped up to acknowledge or accept they're the ones who did it, the sheriff said Sunday. So this is the difference between alleged right-wing extremists and other right-wing extremists like ISIS. ISIS is glad to take credit for the domestic extremism they do, but it seems like right-wingers, not so much. They don't have the balls, apparently, it would seem. They're kind of, you know, a little, little, I don't know, maybe shameful of the things that they do, even though they probably have a good understanding that the right wing is celebrating them online because they're part of it, more than likely, allegedly. As of Wednesday morning, there were 35,000 customers without power, but that number had decreased to 1,200 by the time a 4 p.m. news conference began, according to Duke Energy spokesman Jeff Brooks. A few hours later, the company's website showed zero outages in the area. Given that information, county officials said a nightly curfew will end for good at 5 a.m. Thursday. So that's good news. Glad people are back with power now in winter in a county that has a very large population of elderly people. So they found shell casings and bullets at the the scene. Bullets recovered from the sites and the brass shell casings found a short distance away are the few pieces of physical evidence that investigators have. Because of the heat generated in a high-powered rifle's chamber during rapid fire, fingerprints are burned away and nearly impossible to recover from spent casings. Still, the brass may offer valuable clues. So essentially, if they find casings, they can roughly uh, triangulate where they might have been firing from, meaning that they can look for clues around those areas like footprints and all these other kinds of things. Investigators can enter the casings in the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, a database from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. The database records three-dimensional images of shell casings and can match them to any other shell casings that may have been fired by the same gun at another crime scene or to the gun if the weapon is recovered. The spot where the casings were found can give investigators a way to pinpoint... Oh, well, that's what I just said. So here is some examples of the people who were suffering in North Carolina because of whoever committed the attack, which we still do not know but have good guesses about. For now, schools are closed through Thursday, many stores and restaurants are shut, homes are without heating or running refrigerators, drivers are traversing intersections with no traffic lights. A Red Cross run emergency shelter was set up in Moore County's sports complex to help provide shelter, food, showers, and other services to people impacted. It will remain as a shelter throughout noon on Thursday, officials said.
Nakasha Jackson, who came to the shelter to pick up some hot food, said the outage had been difficult for her one-year-old child. So, if it is allegedly the case that alleged right-wingers wanted to disrupt a drag event to so-called protect the children, well, it turns out your actions putting 45,000 people out of power has not only endangered the lives of the elderly, but also the lives of children who historically cannot survive very well in rough weather conditions and require the protections of their parents and in this case, modern technology that allows us to heat our homes, right? Quote, no lights, no power, can't really do nothing. The kid is scared of the dark, she told CNN. Jackson said sometimes she has to travel up to an hour away to buy food. An hour one way, I'm sorry, so two hours round trip. Quote, it's ridiculous, it should never have been done, Jackson said. Residents who rely on electricity-powered medical equipment have also seen their lives upended. One woman told CNN she came to the shelter because she had no power for her CPAP machine at night. After two days of sleeping without it, she said she began to feel ill and came into the shelter for help. Others have sought shelter, fearing for their safety as they struggled to keep their homes warm. Quote, it's different. It's kind of hard to sleep, you know. But at the end of the day, I'd rather be somewhere where it's warm, where we have food, where we're taken care of, than somewhere it's freezing cold, said Amber Sampson. On top of having to say the shelter, Sampson hasn't been able to work since Sunday after her employer also lost power, an issue that could end up costing her hundreds of dollars. Authorities have expressed anger over the attack, with Carol Haney, mayor of Southern Pines, a town of about 15,900 residents that completely lost lost power, calling it a cruel and selfish act. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper voiced concern over businesses and residents in nursing homes. Quote, When we look at all the money that's being lost by businesses here in Christmas time, when we look at threats to people in nursing homes having lost power, hospitals having to run off generators and not being able to do certain kinds of operations at this point, which is also not new to these alleged right-wing domestic extremists, like the ones that called in fake bomb threats at Boston Children's Hospital that made Boston Children's have to evacuate for 45 minutes and could have interrupted all manner of medical services that were keeping people alive and in good health in that children's hospital, you know, protect the children and all that. All of those are deep concerns here, and we can't let this happen, the Democrat told CNN on Tuesday. Quote, this was a malicious criminal attack on the entire community. I'm glad they're being very forthcoming about it. Though I guess it's easier to be that forthcoming without a direct suspect or anybody being charged. There's additional information that is not in that article that I learned from this Bow of the Fifth column video. Let's talk about an update on Moore County from two days ago at time of recording, where apparently not only did they find shell casings, but there might also be potential for federal investigators in the FBI to maybe use any cell phones that might have been involved in the crime. Now, we don't know that this is 100% confirmed, but apparently there are some rumblings that there might be potential to see, you know, what cell towers information was bouncing off of. Uh, and, you know, one of the people there, or many, might have really fucked up. So we'll link to that video in the description if you want to watch it as well. There's also the older video that he put out when it first came out six days ago, roughly. A lot of interesting information, and Bo is very knowledgeable about a lot of different things regarding these kinds of topics. More so than I am, for sure. But like I say, this kind of stuff is not new. The idea of right-wingers being excited to, and in this case alleged, but uh, right-wingers online being excited to talk about attacking critical infrastructure like power substations, like they say in this article, is also not very new. So this is a Newsweek article about Moore County from Thursday. Neo-Nazis say attack leaving 40,000 Americans in the dark is only the beginning. Amid a long-running campaign by far-right communities threatening to attack the nation's power grid, domestic extremists cheered when two still unattributed shootings in North Carolina substations plunged tens of thousands of people in darkness. So, if it turns out that the people who did it were not right-wingers, the right-wingers online are still cheering for domestic terrorism. And if it's not terrorism, if there's not any political motivation found, if the suspect or charged or whatever than domestic extremism. Beyond celebration, however, their comments called for more bigger attacks targeting critical infrastructure on U.S. soil. Experts told Newsweek that the attack on Moore County, North Carolina, as well as in similar previous attacks across the country, may only be the start of a more destructive campaign. Prior to Saturday's attacks and in the lead-up to the midterm election, Newsweek obtained documents demonstrating dozens of instances of radical groups and individuals sharing threats online against critical infrastructure sites across the nation, along with materials designed to advance such plots. Now, two new reports show how far-right communities, including neo-Nazis, reacted to the most recent sabotage. The more County Sheriff's Office has yet to establish a perpetrator or motive in the December 3rd attack, but initial suspicion has centered on right-wing backlash toward a drag show set to be held the same day at the Sunrise Theater in the town of Southern Pines. That event inspired protests involving armed individuals clad in military gear and in participation of groups such as Moore County Citizens for Freedom, whose director, former U.S. Army Psychological Operations Officer Emily Grace Rainey, was questioned by the Moore County Sheriff's Office after the attack. 
Rainey, who was implicated in the January 6, 2021 storming of the Capitol by pro-President Donald Trump crowds seeking to overturn the presidential election, attributed the substation shootings to, quote, God, whom she said was, quote, chastising Moore County over the drag show. Literal deranged delusions. Like, these are like... She's having, like, visions, and that's apparently what's caused this to happen, she says. By the way, being implicated in the January 6th storming of the Capitol, she doesn't seem to be offended by violence happening. In fact, she seems to support violence happening for political ends, right? You know, trying to do a coup and overturn a Democratic election to unseat then-president-elect Joe Biden and keep then-president Donald Trump in office. Far-right chatter also drew a connection between the attacks on the drag show, which was ultimately held in spite of its detractors. One neo-Nazi telegram post laden with slurs against the LGBT plus community, you could have just said one telegram post, <laughs> and shared with Newsweek by the site intelligence group celebrated the, quote, magnificent act of sabotage as a, quote, beautiful escalation in a broader culture of war. Right-wingers like violence. Right-wingers are excited when violence happens for their political ideology. This is nothing new. This has been going on since the dawn of fucking time. Violence is not inherently right-wing, but violence is a tactic inherent to right-wing politics. You know what I mean? Anybody can do violence, but it seems like one side does it more than the other to the tune of 95% of domestic extremist-related killings over the last 10 fucking years in the United States of America being perpetrated by right-wingers, the majority of which white supremacists. It's not new. The idea that this isn't common knowledge to the American public is absurd and a failure on our media. Another neo-Nazi publication warned that, quote, these attacks will only continue unless such events are not held. So this is similar to what we were hearing from people like Matt Walsh or Tim Poole or uh, that one stupid bitch from Gays Against Groomers or whatever who said, oh, well, if you don't want things like Colorado Springs to happen, you know, when a literal fucking insane, hateful, bigoted piece of shit goes and shoots up a LGBTQ bar motivated by the lies about drag queens and all this. If you don't want that to happen, well, just don't have the drag shows anymore. And there you go. You're fine. But we know that's not true. And we know that's not the extent of it. They don't just want drag queens to stop existing, which in that case is cis men usually who are being gender nonconforming. They don't want any gender nonconforming people to exist. They don't want any trans people to exist. They don't want any gay people to exist. They don't want any queer people to exist at all. It's abundantly clear. All of their rhetoric leads to genocidal logical conclusions. This is nothing new. If you've been watching this show for any amount of time, I'm just kind of beating a dead horse right now, but I feel like I have to. It's very clear. I mean, I think any rational person, if you actually understand the history of domestic extremism in this country, should be able to come to these conclusions. I'm not like some massive brain logic lord figuring this stuff out. Another neo-Nazi publication warned that, quote, these attacks will only continue unless such events are not held. A number of posts on message board 4chan described specific tactics to cause further damage to the power grid. And others proposed conducting similar actions in larger cities such as New York and Washington, D.C. because they, quote, are not majority white. Wow. Rita Katz, founder and executive director of Site Intelligence Group, told Newsweek that the Moore County attack is consistent with the neo-Nazi messaging promulgated online, quote, The sabotage against North Carolina substation aligns perfectly with directives and methods seen in accelerationist neo-Nazi communities, she said, which we at Site have exhaustedly reported on, quote, If this was indeed a far-right terrorist attack, my worry is that it will serve as a proof of concept for other far-right extremists, which it seems to have, right? Because even if it's not, they will take credit for it online. Not in the open. No media figures, no pundits on the right are going to take credit for it. But the people online will, and they're going to be very excited about it. Katz explained, quote, Immediately after the reports about the attacks, we at sites saw such communities praise what happened in North Carolina and call for more, while sharing more directives about what to target and how to do so. Some have specifically suggested large cities. But Katz, who recently authored the book, quote, Saints and Soldiers Inside Internet Age Terrorism from Syria to the Capital Siege, on the threat posed by saboteurs to digital infrastructure, explained how targeting infrastructure as, quote, a key objective for accelerations neo-Nazis who care less about any distinct outcome and far more about sowing any kind of chaos. Quote, it is these communities that have inspired mass shooters all over the world, she stated. Quote, thus, if this act of sabotage was indeed inspired by these communities, it is yet more proof how dangerous these online spaces are, as I described in my recent book on internet age terrorism. This should literally be common knowledge. I don't know how it's not. The idea that it's not is literally dangerous, not only just to queer people in this instance, but also to everybody. The people who lost power in Moore County, the 45,000 people who lost power, aren't all queer drag queens, right? A one-year-old child suffered as a result. 
elderly people suffered as a result. You would imagine many of which are conservative. Elderly people in North Carolina being conservative? Shocking. This is not simply targeted to do damage to people that they don't like. It's also hitting other people in collateral, I guess. Uh, which I guess they're okay with. They're okay to throw away some of their own to get the infinitesimally small percentage of people they don't like who are apparently simultaneously super weak, but also all-powerful. A second report shared with Newsweek by the Middle East Media Research Institute Domestic Terrorism Threat Monitor featured a neo-Nazi collective on Telegram calling for more attacks on some stations and railways, as well as grocery stores and centers for the online megastore Amazon. The same channel forwarded a video from another account that showed two men armed with rifles opening fire on what one describes as a, quote, water plant. The clip ends with a message, quote, kill infrastructure and is subtitled in English and Russian. So essentially what they're attempting to do here is that they've got a lot of doomsday preppers on their side. They've got a people with weapons and who do, uh, you'd imagine, a small amount of training uh, with them. They're really excited about a potential Civil War II electric boogaloo, right? I imagine what their hope is, is to attack this critical infrastructure, sow chaos in America broadly in all the areas that are there, and then try to take advantage of that chaos and do violence, damage further, you know, the infrastructure of these places, uh, and attempt to take power in these places like little warlords, right? I think that would be what they fantasize about when they're jerking themselves raw to uh, questionable materials online. Some of the content in the two reports overlap with one another and with materials previously seen by Newsweek in October in a corporate intelligence security memo and an intelligence assessment issued by the California State Threat Assessment Center. It's not just me talking about all this shit. There's actual people talking about it in positions of power. The FBI is investigating Moore County. There's a lot here. One earlier post by a neo-Nazi publication in summer referenced by Katz included, quote, a detailed manual that called Power Grids the main satiating tool the system uses to keep the masses from riding and advised on ways to inflict maximum damage. Quote, the guide even advised on what to target when, quote, shooting at substations, which notably fits with the reported method by which the substations in North Carolina were attacked, Katz said. Since the manual was released, its many sections have been regularly shared across neo-Nazi online venues. With such material readily available to would-be saboteurs, DTM director Simon Perdue told Newsweek that, quote, the threat posed by attacks on critical infrastructure cannot be underestimated. The situation in Moore County offers only a glimpse into the chaos that attacks such as this can cause, and larger scale assaults could bring disruption on a statewide or even national level, Purdue said, referencing, quote, a steady slew of manifestos, social media posts, videos, and even instruction manuals on this kind of attack being produced by extremists over the past few years. And why are these right-wingers doing this? They are afraid of people who are queer because it upsets their hierarchies that they enjoy. That's all it is. The idea that all of this is happening, that they're doing this kind of violence, they're ruining people's lives, they're potentially ruining their own lives if they get caught and convicted, all for what? For nothing. These motherfuckers are still poor, they're still hating their lives, probably working jobs that they don't like. Nothing changes for them. They just get to feel a little bit better because the lies they've been fed, the propaganda that they've been fed by politicians and pundits trying to get them to give them money and get them into power in elected office, it brings them to this point and they get nothing out of it. The idea that our society has allowed this to fester is kind of a condemnation on the so-called superiority of Western civilization. It's not to say this kind of thing doesn't happen in other countries, but certainly the United States is a special case given the fact that there are more guns here than our people. Purdue noted that, quote, this is not the first attempted attack on electrical infrastructure by extremist groups and that many threats envision much more ambitious attacks against critical infrastructure across the nation. Should such an attack succeed, the consequences could far exceed those experienced by Moore County. Quote, if a large scale attack were to occur in a major city or against a major node in the, either the electrical, gas or water infrastructure, we could see very deadly results, Purdue said. Some accelerationists have spoken about using large scale blackouts caused by such an attack as cover for further directed terror attacks. I, I have not read the rest of this article. I've read up to like a previous point. Ah, but here you go. While others have prompted the sowing of discord to incite riots and further violence. Quote, the Moore County case was a small scale when compared to some of the plans that we have seen, he added, and infrastructure needs to be better protected against such attacks. Newsweek has previously reported on concerns over the limited tool set available to federal law enforcement when it comes to pursuing domestic threats without any clear foreign connection, as is the case when investigating activity associated with groups such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamist State militant group ISIS. So it is easier for the feds to go after ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but not Yal qaeda right? in the United States of America, because we've got our own terrorists, the domestic kind, all of which are right-wingers, like 95% of which. 
Further complicating federal probes is the fact that many of the far-right communities promoting ideologically driven attacks on infrastructure do not abide by traditional group structures. Quote, while some of these groups are indeed organized and structured, the kind of ideology that underlies an attack such as this often relies on leaderless resistance and directed self-radicalization, Purdue said. So this is the kind of stochastic terrorism that we talk about ad nauseum on this channel and every other left-wing channel out there because for some reason, it's gotten a little bit better in the mainstream media and the liberals in it, but for some reason for a very long time, it was only lefties and leftists talking about stochastic terrorism and how it works, even though it's literally been used in, say, Nazi Germany, right? A lot of these same tactics. Quote, many extremists are moving away from the group model, believing that groups are vulnerable to infiltration or other targeting from law enforcement and towards what they tend to call lone wolf attacks, the results of stochastic terrorism. You whip people up into a frenzy and we have the material conditions in the United States where they can easily obtain weapons to do these attacks. You feed them lies, propaganda, get them very upset about their own station in life. Also, coincidentally, do nothing to improve their station in life. You would imagine a lot of these people might think twice about ruining their lives if they had anything going for them to begin with. Maybe if there was a better social safety net, people could get higher education without going bankrupt. People could get sick without going bankrupt. People could work a job for 40 hours a week and be able to pay the bills and keep the lights on. Uh, but no, because we lack all of this in this shithole country, these people don't have anything going for them and are willing to throw their lives away because drag queens confuse them sexually or something. I don't know. Quote, it bears saying, however, that no attack happens in a vacuum, he added, and the dissemination of materials and radicalization process are very clearly intentional and directed. But the digital, decentralized, and domestic nature of the threat continues to serve as a potentially dangerous blind spot for federal agencies. Maybe you should start working on that, I think. It seems like domestic terrorism has changed from people being very out and about about it, like the KKK, for instance, and is a new form, an alt, maybe, an alt domestic terror form, maybe alt-right domestic terror form uh, that's a little bit more difficult to tackle and requires specialized tools and uh, methods. Quote, we find that many of these real-world attacks come from singular individuals or small cells whose engagement with a wider extremist milieu happens primarily online, Purdue said. This makes intervention and disruption extremely difficult, he explained. But law enforcement, Congress, and tech companies have a responsibility to prevent the dissemination of violent and harmful content online, and this will play a key role in preventing this kind of attack in the future. Except maybe not on Twitter anymore, uh, because Elon Musk is uh, literally far right. It doesn't matter what he tells you. He's literally talking about how his pronouns are prosecute Fauci or whatever. Uh, the cringiest lay Reddit tip tip milady, thank you for the gold kind of stranger kind of shit you could possibly see. Also talking about how calling somebody what they want to be called, be it name or pronouns, is apparently too much to ask for and somehow an attack on him. He said in a recent tweet, I'm paraphrasing, uh, even though right-wingers are more than happy to call Kanye West yay, I digress. While such threats and attacks have persisted for years, including the infamous unsolved April 2013 organized assault on a substation in Metcalf, California, far-right mobilization is on the rise overall, according to the Armed Conflict and Location Event Data ACLED project. By the way, I believe it's this project that showed, with very, very generous definitions of a so-called violent protest, that the BLM protests, I believe, were around 93% peaceful, for as much as the right is like, anytime you bring up the fact that 95% of domestic extremist-related killings over the last 10 years years were done by the right wing, they will immediately whataboutism to, oh, well, what about the BLM protests? 93% were peaceful, and that's a generous estimate. It seems like more of them were peaceful if you account for police provocation and the very liberal definition of violent protest that the ACLED used. An ACLED report released Tuesday found that, quote, right-wing activity in 2022 was on track to exceed the level of activity reported in 2021, a year already to find deep polarization in the wake of the January 6th riots. The report noted that the two primary factors driving the surge were, quote, continued support of white supremacy and white nationalism, two of which are just terrorist ideologies, based on conspiracy, which ramped up last year, and, quote, anti-LGBT plus mobilization, which has seen an uptick in activity since the summer. Surely that has nothing to do with the lies and slander pushed by people like Tucker Carlson, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Jesse Waters, you know, Laura Ingram, any of these on Fox News, you know, surely none of these people's words could have any of an effect that would lead to a massive uptick in anti-LGBT plus violence and mobilization. Surely not. That would be crazy to think about, you know, using your brain, rubbing at least the two brain cells you have together to figure out fucking water is wet, man. It's so fucking obvious. The ACLED report also mentioned North Carolina specifically as a state in which anti-LGBT plus rhetoric has long been salient. Data showed that in the months leading up to the midterm election, quote, almost all demonstrations involving far-right groups were anti-LGBT plus. Seems like queer people are the new minority to be focused on.
And by the way, the reason for this is because we're winning, by the way. Queer people, the LGBTQIA plus community is winning worldwide, but specifically in the United States of America. Rates of acceptance are going up. Rates of people who report to know at least like one queer person or trans person are going up that seem to coincide with acceptance. More and more laws protecting queer people are being proposed, if not passed, though of course a lot of anti ones are in response to this, right? Gay was legalized in 2015 in the Supreme Court, which that might be overturned, we don't know yet. The high priests haven't come to a decision on that in the supposed democracy we live in, uh, but that's literally why. The reason why this kind of thing is happening is because it is literally a backlash, right? This is why when Tucker Carlson opens up a segment saying, oh, another weekend in Weimar, he's saying that, oh yeah, if queer people just living their lives it becomes an accepted thing, which is totally normal and should offend nobody, well then the Nazis might come to power, right? And that's kind of an implicit threat he's using there. Like, oh, it's another week in Weimar, which is usually used as one of the many pretexts to the Holocaust, right? It's quite literally because queer people are becoming more and more accepted and they understand they're losing the culture war, as it were, against them, that now they have to resort to violence. They're taking their ball and uh, going home, as it were, right? They realize that, and this is also the reason why the right, which has forever been anti-democratic, uh, so much so that they even tried to secede from the Union and create, you know, a second country, the Confederacy, because they didn't like democracy. They didn't like that they were losing and they wanted to keep their slaves, right? The reason why they do voter suppression, the reason why they gerrymander. Republicans and right-wingers understand that their ideology is not popular. In fact, their ideology is disgusting to a lot of rational, normal people. So they have to result to anti-democratic methods. They understand that they can no longer pull the wool over people's eyes to get them to vote for them in such sufficient numbers that the Democrats lose. So now they're gonna go and just, you know, forego democracy entirely and try to institute some kind of theocratic authoritarian regime like in Saudi Arabia. The article goes on, meanwhile, the investigation continues on local, state, and federal levels into what actually happened to the two Duke Energy substations in Moore County. Major Andy Conway of the Moore County Sheriff's Office told Newsweek that at this stage, quote, all possibilities are being explored and investigated and that, quote, no threats whatsoever were made prior to the incident. The spokesperson for the FBI, which is also involved in the probe, told Newsweek that the Bureau, quote, cannot comment on, quote, specific questions regarding the ongoing investigation, but that, quote, the FBI remains vigilant and works closely with our law enforcement partners, blah, 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 blah. As always, the spokesperson added, we ask members of the public to report or anything they consider suspicious to law enforcement. Oh, by the way, I should mention, speaking of that Bow the Fifth Column video about the updates on Moore County, uh, if you didn't know, North Carolina has felony murder charges. And uh, it seems like that if anybody died as a result of losing power, you know, and because we know the power substations were intentionally taken out in a coordinated manner, if anybody did die, there is potential that those people could be brought up on charges related to that, which uh, would be really cool to see. I'm not gonna lie. It's sad that anybody might pass away. I think I've heard reports that one person has. I've not seen any substantiation of that. Uh, of course, it is sad that it happens, but it's good when justice is doled out, and it would be nice to see for these people. And if not that, luckily, you know, if nobody has passed as a result of it, they still get met with the full force of the law, which we don't often see, you know, when it comes to a lot of this kind of stochastic mobilization. A spokesperson for the Department of Homeland Security, which oversees the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, said that, quote, DHS will continue to share information with the FBI and state and local authorities as the investigation unfolds. The spokesperson added that, quote, CISA leadership and regional teams have offered support to Duke Energy as they work to restore service. Joe Biden, blah, blah, blah. All right. I think that's that. Uh, so this is all about Moore County, and a lot has been said about Moore County recently in North Carolina. Uh, but it turns out this is not the only substation that's been attacked. This article from the Seattle Times from December 7th, 2022 reads, quote, PSE, so Puget Sound Energy, substations among six attacked in the Pacific Northwest in November of this year. Six of them. This is not new, and it is not lone wolves. Quote, at least six attacks at electricity substations in Washington and Oregon, including two at Puget Sound Energy substations, have been reported to the FBI in recent weeks. Spokespeople for Puget Sound Energy, the Cowlitz County Public Utility District, Portland General Electric, and Bonneville Power Administration confirmed that attacks happened in November, according to emails sent in response to Seattle Times inquiries. The FBI declined to confirm it is investigating the attacks, but the utilities say they are cooperating with a federal investigation. It wasn't immediately known whether the damage to Northwest substations resulted in 
than any disruption of power. News of the attacks follows the shooting investigators say damaged substations in North Carolina, as we've talked about so far. BPA spokesperson Douglas Johnson says, quote, a deliberate physical attack at a Clackamaw, Oregon substation occurred over the Thanksgiving holiday. A fence was cut and equipment was damaged, Johnson wrote. BPA is a key player in the Northwest Power Transmission System that supplies power to federal hydroelectric dams to regional utilities as well as those elsewhere in the West. Quote, BPA is actively cooperating with the FBI in this incident has encouraged other utilities throughout the region to increase their vigilance and report any suspicious or similar activity to law enforcement, Johnson wrote. It does certainly seem like power substations are going to be a thing that state officials and federal officials are going to have to look at securing more because it seems like at least neo-Nazis are very excited about these attacks happening and are sharing materials to facilitate more of it. Johnson declined to give details about the equipment damage. On Thursday, the BPA released additional information about the attack, which occurred in the early morning hours of November 24th to a substation along its main transmission line. Quote, Someone clearly wanted to damage equipment and possibly cause a power outage, said Transmission Vice President of Field Services John Laddie. Quote, The damage and associated cleanup will cost Northwest ratepayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. We are fortunate to avoid any power supply disruption, which would have jeopardized public safety, increased financial damages, and presented challenges to the community on a holiday. So, in this specific instance, whoever it was that attacked these power substations. You can draw patterns to who it might be, but this is all alleged. We don't know yet. They didn't actually succeed like they did in North Carolina in cutting out the power here in the Pacific Northwest. Turns out all they did was cost themselves if they live here, which they probably live around. A lot of them don't live in Seattle proper, but a lot of them live around it. That's the same for Portland. Portland is a battleground between Antifa and fascists, not because there's a bunch of them that live there together, but because people in the right wing that live in Idaho and other surrounding rural areas in Oregon and Washington travel into the cities where the libs are to own them by doing domestic terrorism and shows of force. Uh, they literally have to ship people from around the country as well to do this a lot of the time because they don't have enough numbers by default. So it, all it's really done is cost people who pay electric bills in these areas more money on their electric bills. The FBI Seattle field office declined to comment on the incidents nor confirm reports that the agency has sent bulletins to local law enforcement agencies and utility companies warning of attacks, but said the agency, quote, routinely shares information with our law enforcement partners to assist in protecting the communities they serve. Because they have to be, if they're actively investigating this shit, they can't be saying that because then that might influence changes in the behavior of the people doing it. So if they want to get as much evidence in as good of a case as possible, they have to be very, uh, you know, PR about it public relations. They can't be too out and about about it because it might change the behaviors of people that are doing the attacks and they want to get as much evidence and maybe catch people in the act if they can. So they don't want to disrupt any of that. So they have to be like more PR about it. They have to be very, you know, vague. Also in Oregon, Portland, General Electric reports, quote, a deliberate physical attack on a Clackamaw area substation in late November. Puget Sound Energy attacks occurred in late November at two substations, according to Gerald Tracy, media engagement program manager for the utility company. Quote, we can't comment on the incidents because they are both an ongoing investigation involving the FBI, Tracy wrote. Tracy declined to comment on where the substations are located or the extent of the damage. Southwest Washington's Cowlitz County Public Utility District sustained, quote, vandalism on two substations in mid-November in the Woodland area. Quote, at this time, we do not have any further comment. Our facilities have since been repaired, said spokesperson Alice Dietz in a written statement. A spokesperson for the Snohomish County Public Utility District, the largest public utility district in the state, says substations in its jurisdictions have not been attacked this year, but they have been vandalized in the past. Seems to be a pattern of behavior. Someone somewhere out there is really excited about attacking power substations. Wonder who that could be. A spokesperson for Governor Jay Inslee said the governor's office defers to utilities to describe specific threats. Quote, we are aware of increased threats to our utilities and are monitoring threat activity in our support and coordination role with federal and local governments and individual utilities. Executive Director of Communications Jamie Smith wrote, a spokesperson for the King County Sheriff's Office declined to confirm if the agency has received an FBI bulletin about substation attacks, but said the office has not, quote, found anything to support that this happened in our jurisdiction. With utilities releasing few details on the Northwest attacks, it's difficult to assess who is responsible in their motivation, said David Nywert, a Washington State-based senior staff writer for the Daily Coast and author of, quote, Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump. Yahoo sometimes go out and shoot things up and the power utilities are a frequent target, Nywert said. How much damage did these attacks do and how knowledgeable were the attackers? That's what we need to do to make an assessment. The North Carolina attack underscored the vulnerability of the nation's power grid to attacks on substations, which are often located in rural, unpopulated areas. Although those responsible for the attacks are unknown currently, the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis warned in January that extremist groups in the United States appear to increasingly view attacking the power grid as a means of disrupting the country. Domestic extremists, quote, have developed credible 
credible specific plans to attack electricity infrastructure since at least 2020, according to a DHS report. In February, three men pleaded guilty to conspiring to attack U.S. energy facilities. Authorities said they were driven by white supremacist ideologies to, quote, sow mayhem and division among Americans. Oh my god, I'm so shocked. Holy. Anyway, so all of this is to say that the right wing is the greatest domestic terror threat to this country's national security and always has been. It has never been the other way around, it always has been. Now, given that, you need to be prepared. Now, this is not to be like doomsday prepper about it, because those people are insane. But it's just to be prepared just in case, just to know certain things, be knowledgeable about certain things, should anything go sideways, right? Bo the Fifth Column actually has a lot of really good videos about this. I've shared this playlist before, and I will continue to share it. Uh, community networking with Bo the Fifth Column. I would definitely look to, let's talk about Community Networking 101, let's talk about shy community networking for all you shy people out there, let's talk about community networks and what you can do, etc, etc. It's very, very important that you get to know people around you that are of similar mindset, i.e. people who do not like when right-wingers do domestic extremist violence and terrorism and would like to be able to help each other should anything go wrong. If you were in Moore County when they lost power, it would have been nice, you would imagine, for a lot of these people if they had other neighbors that they knew they could lean on in a time of crisis. This is not just related to extremism either. It's for any kind of disaster, a natural disaster, if a hurricane comes through, a tornado comes through, if the area loses power, divorced from the conversation of neo-Nazis being very excited about attacking power substations. It's very important to be able to get to know the people around you, get to know people of a similar mindset, not just like the people you live around and know that they're cool or whatever, but people you can actively do things with, do actions with protest with, raise money for, volunteer with, you know, things like that. And you make some friends. Maybe find a cutie that you end up being more than friends with. Who knows? It's all good. Very cool. Uh, also, we live in America. There are more guns than there are people here, and you have a Second Amendment right to defend yourself. If you are comfortable enough, and I know not everybody is, I am, I lived in an armed household, but if you are not comfortable enough, there are other alternatives, but if you are, firearms. Very important. We see how the John Brown Elm Fork Gun Club showing up outside of a uh, drag event made a bunch of the right-wingers who went to terrorize the people there and intimidate them to shut the event down at best, at worst hurt them, ended up just doing fan cams and making silly faces and looking discouraged because there were literally lefties with guns outside these events. I know there's a lot of lefties that don't like guns, but we have more of them than there are people in this country, and it seems like the conditions are such that we need our own to defend these places. It's not really up to us if that becomes the reality or not, and it has. So if you are comfortable with it, responsible firearm ownership. The first part of that is determining if you're comfortable with it or not. You know, if you have any kind of mental problems that you think would conflict with your ability to do so safely. Clearly, I'm not saying everybody should do it. This is something you assess. It is part of responsible firearm ownership before you even own the damn thing, right? Also, once you have come to that conclusion, you know, you can just go to a range. Find a buddy, go to a range, ask if either of you don't know anything about it, but ideally you find somebody who does. Ask if they have, like, classes you could take or if they could, like, quickly show you how to do it or whatever. There are usually people there that are more than willing to help. It, just to be familiar with it. And I say this to not just be the people who have decided they want to own a firearm for self-defense, but also for everybody. Every single lefty out there should know what a gun is, how to operate one, how to make one incapable of operation, etc., etc. Because we live in a country where there are more guns than there are people, you might, God forbid, run into one one day, and maybe you might need to know how to use it. So say some gunman, like in Colorado Springs, uh, shows up. Luckily, a veteran ended up kicking his ass uh, along with a trans woman to stop him. What, like, if, the, if he has a sidearm, which he did, and he loses it in that scuffle and it's on the ground, well, now there's a gun on the ground. Do you know what a gun is? Do you know how to use one? Do you know how to get the magazine out? Do you know how to eject the bullet from the chamber, right? These are things that you would want to know to keep the people safe around you, or God forbid you have to use it after you've picked it up. These are just things to know. It's incredibly unlikely that you ever have to use this knowledge in like a real world situation like that but it's not impossible right so being prepared you'd rather you know know how to use it and not have to than have to use it and not know how very simple also generally it makes it easier for you to defend your anti-gun talking points should you choose to do so 
because nobody likes it when a liberal is talking about being anti-gun when they don't even know how the fuck the thing works. Uh, when they think AR stands for assault rifle, right? It just really makes your arguments worse. But anyway, in addition to this, there are also non-lethal methods of self-defense, like general self-defense when it comes to close quarters combat. You know, the old punchy punch, the old one-two. Learning how to throw a punch, learning how to take a punch. Very important, because who knows when this is happening. Grappling, very important. Most important, some may say, because if you can get somebody on the ground and incapacitate them that way, uh, is definitely going to be a lot safer for you. Understanding about, uh, you know, a variety of other weapons like blades and whatnot and how to deal with them should you encounter them. Uh, there's also things like stun guns, you know, the ones that you jab into somebody that have the two electrodes, tasers, which are not as effective, I've heard, uh, and also not as easy to get or maybe legal where you might be. Those are the ones that shoot the electrodes out. Uh, pepper spray is the very common one, which is not the easiest point in, you know, press the thingy to get it to shoot out, because what if, you know, there's wind coming at you, you don't want to hit yourself with it, <clears throat> all this kind of shit, there's considerations for all of it, blunt objects like a tire iron in your car, or a skateboard if you're a skater, uh, knowing how to swing that thing around, you know, also, incredibly importantly, first aid. Understanding how to stop the bleeding should you ever be in a situation where you need to on yourself or another person. Being able to do first responder type shit before proper medical professionals can show up to help. All of this is very, very important. Also, when it comes to the self-defense implements, consistent training in their use. If you, you shouldn't just buy a thing and then never use it or train how to use it, you need to train how to use it. The best way to be the most effective with that implement, should God forbid you ever need it, is to do it regularly so it becomes second nature. So it becomes muscle memory, right? Very important. Anyway, uh, I've talked about this all before and I will continue to talk about it because it's never going to not be important. Even in a completely peaceful society, this should be something taught to people. First, in my view, first aid should be taught to people in school. In my view, ideally there would be like classes for general self-defense. Let's just, you know, like punch and grappling. It could be part of PE, you know what I mean? And it's a good aerobic exercise. We have a heavy bag here. I punch that shit. Not only is it good for training your punching, but it's also a good aerobic exercise. It gets your heart pumping. It gets your lungs pumping. It's very good. It's all very important. It's uh, an unfortunate time we live in. I personally have been thinking about this a lot. This is not the kind of content that, generally speaking, I would want to be making right now. If it was up to me, I would literally just be like a Mario speedrunner that, like, moonlighted as just like a random normie content creator on YouTube. Maybe with some politics sprinkled in, right? Uh, but literally, my identity is at threat in the current situation in our society, uh, in the United States. So now this is something I have to do. And I know it sucks to have to hear all the time. But we live in the world we live in. So I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're vibing out there. If any of you have actually gotten involved in your communities from watching my videos, have set up your little community networks, it doesn't have to be big. You can have like a one, two, three friends that you had like practice, train with, whatever. Uh, you know, let me know in the comments if that's something you feel comfortable with doing. I'd be interested to read that. I'd hope to read that as well. Uh, and uh, take it easy. This video is kind of called as Fallen Lulu. Thanks so much for the support. Hope you're doing the damn thing. If you'd like to be next Connor Collin, all you gotta do is follow me on Twitter, at ConnorCC, retweet my video links when they go live. Also hit up my Tumblr, tumblr.com slash ConnorCC as well, I think is what takes you there. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All notifications on when you hit the bell. Leave a like if you'd like. Comment something down below about how armed queers bash back and have a fantastic rest of the time that you have to do whatever it is you're doing right now, which probably isn't a whole lot of anything because you're watching one of my videos.